Okay, thank you very much for the for the introduction, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for uh, for inviting me here. It's been a pleasure to be here in uh, in Madrid again after uh, two and a half years, more or less. I was here at the same conference in the first edition, so it's a big pleasure for me to be here again. And um, so, as you can see from the title, this is a, a joint it's a joint research project together with Sheldon Dantas and Peter Hayek. And uh, as you can also see from my next slide, I don't have so many slides, and I do have a lot of time. So I was actually hoping the bus could be counting on the bus to be a bit late, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Perfect in time today, by the way. Nice shot, the bus was there. <laughs> so <laughs> there is time. So in case you have questions, please feel free to ask, and there will be time for answer. So uh, I will uh, be representing the Vanak space part of the conference, I would say, but some of the questions I would pose are of relevance also for Banach lattices. So many of the things I will ask are unknown for Banach lattices, even for CFK spaces. So maybe if, if the results are formulated for Banach spaces, some of the stuff I can talk about is hopefully being also for people Banach lattices. So there should be a connecting team. And I will start uh, very much in meta stress, and I will start writing on that part of the blackboard, the main and actually unique problem I will, I will be focused on all the talk so if at some point you feel lost you can just look here and you will find the unique thing that you want to do in all the talk okay so in all the talk we are interested in the following situation so we have a given balance space x and we want to find so given so is the uh, Can you tell me when you don't read anymore? Yeah, no, it's fine, Joe. This is fine. Can, can you can see the way, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can so, see. So is there y some containing x and y has to be a dense subspace? So is there y inside x? Dense subspace. Yeah. Y has a C, let's say CK norm. So the general theme would be we have a Banach space and you have some degree of smoothness and you want to know if you can find a dense subspace y of x which admits a norm with this degree of differentiability. So is there a dense subspace with a C infinity smooth norm, with a C1 smooth norm and so on. So the first thing I have to do is to convince you that this is not entirely nonsense and it deserves some investigation. But since this uh, conference is not exactly entirely dedicated to smoothness, I guess I should start really from the basics, so from smoothness 101. And uh, how we start saying what is a norming in, in this context. So a norming theory appeared already in several talks, for example, in talk uh, yesterday by Maria Angelica, she was talking about a norming AM spaces. And in general, I guess we can agree that the norming theory means the problem of finding on a certain Banach space or a certain norm space, a norm which is the strongest possible form of a specific property. So if you have a certain norm space as a certain property, you want to find a norm on the space where this property is attained in the maximal strongest, in the strongest possible way. So I don't know, you can obtain the maximum, the best smoothness. So you can want to obtain locally uniform rotten norms, uniformly convex norms, solidly convex, these kind of things. And here, the property will always be smoothness. So we will always be talking about differentiable norms. And again, since we are in smoothness 101, here is the definition of differentiability. And maybe somebody, of course, everybody saw the definition of derivative, <laughs> but maybe somebody never went into infinite dimensional uh, differentiability. So just to make sure that we all agree the definition is identical, there is no difference, right? The, the thing, you just have to take point, the function is differential because there is a bounded linear operator which gives you the first order approximation. So the definition is identical. When you pass to infinite dimensional smoothness, the definition is the same. There is no difference. And likewise, everything which is of computational nature carried over. So uh, Leibniz rule, the chain rule, differentiability of the sum of functions, the definition of CK smoothness, what does it mean? Well, it means that the function that to the point X associates its derivative is continuous. So this is the C1 function. C2, well, you take this function here, the, to the point that gives the derivative, and you try to take this derivative, and so on and so forth. So it's all identical. So all this stuff carries over with any uh, difference, actually also the implicit function theorem. It's just based on 
completeness of the or the space of operator so it works as well as long as y is complete y x doesn't have to be so everything that is only depending on computational machinery works identical you don't have to even bother thinking it's just the same what we would be seen to be changed is existence of derivatives this is not surprising and in many different areas you know that existence of derivatives is a much more subtle problem right? differentiability of Lipschitz functions rather than liquid spaces uh, differentiability of convex functions Aston phase and so on just to see one uh, more example let's take let's take lp uh, for p not integer for, for the sake of simplicity and the canonical norm is of order is differentiable of the uh, integer part of p many times but not more in other words it has exactly the same smoothness of the function t to the power of p right absolute value of t to the p if you take the function absolute value of p the p and p is not integer this function is exactly differentiable integer part of p many times and not more so the differentiality in lp is the same as the one of these functions so it's kind of the optimal one and this is uh again it's a computation so it has to be routine okay right? there is a proof in many books and it's just doing computations but what is a bit more subtle is that you cannot obtain any better smoothness in lp so if you are norm lp you will never get a norm which is one more differentiable okay? so this is one of the themes for example of the talk how how smooth can a norm be now um smoothness is a never-ending subject so a course in smoothness could go on for infinitely many hours i only have one i do have one which is a lot of time but i cannot really go in basics for too long so i'm just adding some references for people who are interested this is the super classics in uh, the classic in smoothness the vehicle of i think it's short-handed by everybody by digit z in everybody's bibliography it has to, it has to be short-handed by this way and a more recent monograph by Pat Vajek and Michal Ioannis, smooth analysis in Banach spaces. It kind of beats over the previous results. So this is the basics. Now, what was next? I was talking about existence of derivatives. And the next slide contains essentially only one sentence. The smoothness does not come for free. So if you have a Banach space with a smooth norm, then you are actually requiring a lot on the Banach space itself. So this is the most uh, probably well-known and old also type of result. If you have a C1 smooth norm on a separable Banach space, then the dual is also separable. So for example, so you, you have a, what is now called a husband space. So for example, L1 doesn't have any smooth norm because it's dual and infinity is non separable. And more, by Perchinsky's result, one of these many Perchinsky's uh, Result about basic sequences, every infinite dimensional closed subspace of L1 contains an isomorphic copy of L1. So it cannot have a smooth norm because it contains L1. So if you take closed subspaces of L1, there never is a smooth norm. So you already see that even if you take something honestly nice, smoothness might fail. And then there are uh, there is a huge list of results. I'm listing some just to fill the slides. Uh, here there is this very elegant characterization, characterization of Hilbert spaces. If you have C2 smoothness both in the space and in the dual, well, you have a Hilbert space, which again seems quite a uh, reasonably weak assumption, but actually it's extremely strong. And if you go to higher order smoothness, but only in the space, so nothing on the dual, there is this line of research started with Fabian Wittler and Zisler and then uh, sharpened by, by Robert Deville. So if you already if you only assume C2 smoothness, actually, in reality, one could only require C1 and the derivative to be locally uniformly continuous. But let's let's just stay with C2. Then there are two cases. Either the space contains C0, or it is super reflexive, which means uniformly convex norming, and it has type 2. And if the norm happens to be C infinity smooth, then of course there is the first case, it can contain C0. And if it does not contain C0, well, it is super reflexive. It has type two by the previous theorem. And it also has exact cotype 2K. What does it mean exact? It means that it has cotype 2K, where K is integer. So the, and there is, it has no better cotype. So the infimum of cotypes is attained and is an even integer. Moreover, the space contains L2K, which means in particular that spaces with simple smooth norm contain either C0 of 
L2, or L, not L2, L, LP, for some even integer, actually. So, for example, there is no uh, serial Sontai space in this context. Okay? So, you have to contain sequence spaces. And now, if somebody saw this theorem for the first time in their life, there is like, well, it contains C0, but I mean, the ball of C0 is a, is a cube. Is it, is it differentiable? I mean, there are corners. So, can the first case actually happen? I mean, can, can, can it really be that a space with a simply smooth norm contains C0? I mean, this would imply that C0 has a simply smooth norm, right? And if you never saw these results, I mean, why should C0 have a simply smooth norm, right? I mean, the theorems, in, the way I formulated them, imply that C0 must have a simply smooth norm. Because if not, I wrote them in a nonsense way. So, well, I will answer this in a couple of slides. But I mean, you know the answer already. There has to be a simply smooth norm on C0. If not, I will be wasting my and yours time. And one more result. Um, now, I don't define LFC here. I will define it in a few slides again. It doesn't really matter too much what the definition is. It's a shorthand for locally dependent on finitely many coordinates. And you probably understand why you need the shorthand because it's not a line and a half. And I will talk about what it means later. But it really means, I mean, what is the definition? But it really means like very similar to the C0 norm. So not surprisingly, it has to be C0 saturated. Now, all these results, all the proofs, are for Banach spaces. I hope I wrote it everywhere. And it merely means that completeness is needed in all of the probes. And in, I think all of them, there is some variational principle involved. In this and this, there is a equivalent variational principle. In some of them, there is a compact variational principle here, the smooth one, and so on and so forth. And variational principle require completeness because you, you want to build a point where something happens and you build it by approximation. So you need completeness. Too. So none of this slide can be proven without completeness, or at least with the current techniques. Maybe because we don't have the right techniques, or maybe because there are lots of faults. So let's give a look at the norm uh, uh, context. Now, take a normal space, and let's take the easiest possible case, the linear span of a sequence, so a countable algebraic basis. Now, uh, I believe there was an open problem, but I never found it explicitly stated. But I have um, retrospectively arguments to claim that there was an open problem because both Jon van der Werf and Pat Hayek were PhD students of Václav Zizler in the, that period. And they were in the same university and they were working on the same problems. So it's kind of conceivable that Václav was aware of a problem of this nature. Also in the same period, uh, Václav, uh, Robert and Gilles Godfrey were writing their book and talking to Gilles, he commented with me that he was aware of this type of problems. So the problem, yes, could be if you take a normal space with a countable algebraic basis, can you build smooth norms? Or can you obtain the same, for example, probability of the dual if you have a smooth norm? So it was not explicitly stated, or at least I didn't find it in the literature, but there was a problem about building smooth norms in absence of completeness. And so with the other results, well, Van der Werf proved that if you have a space with countable algebraic basis, you can build a C1 smooth norm. Hayek improved to C infinity, and later, together with David and Fong, obtained an analytic norm, which means locally power series. And in the same paper, they also have a polyhedral norm. And polyhedral norm, which will appear at some point later on. So a bit later, uh, I don't remember how, well, quite a bit later, I don't remember which year this book uh, was written, like 2015, 14, 17, I don't remember, something at the time, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a rather recent book, I, I forgot writing it. So there is this uh, monograph to Giramont, the Sinus and Zizler, dedicated to open problems in analysis and the geometry of Banach spaces. And among other things, they ask, if you take L1 gamma, where gamma is uncountable, so non-separable Banach space, and you take the finitely supported vectors, so the linear span of the, of the canonical basis, does it have a C, a C1 smooth norm? So in the separable case, it was solved. So the question was like, well, take a non-separable space, which would behave badly for differentiability. We saw it before. This is a bad space for differentiability. Can you build C1 smoothness in dense subspaces? And this was the first starting point for us. And we were like, well, but why just L1? Why don't you take any non-separable Banach space and try to see what happens? And now this is this. Copied essentially copy pasted well yeah there's not why but so 
this question was formulated in, in that paper a couple of years ago for the first time explicitly, at least to the best of my knowledge. But as I was saying before, it was known at least to these people, the authors of the, the Vigor Francisco book and, and somebody else probably in, in the 90s. So there is some history behind this type of, this, this type of questions. And there is also some other instance, not exactly the same question, but something similar in uh, Benjamin Ebenezer's geometric uh, <coughs> nonlinear function analysis, which contains an infinite amount of material and of questions. So I would like to advertise this because, I mean, it's hard to remember everything which is there. So they ask first a very vague question. If you have a smooth norm on some large subset of a Banach space, can you deduce that the space is Aspen? Of course, this is not mathematics because you, the point is you should define large in a way that it gives the theorem, but it's a meaningful notion. Because if you say that large is equal to x, you are done. But you want to find some, I don't know, meager residual uh, sigma quarters, this kind of stuff. Maybe there are, there are some notions, such, such notions. But they, they observed that at least when they were writing the book, there was no indication in the literature about this kind of thing. And then they give an explicit example. So for example, can you build a normal L1, which is differentiable outside a countable union of closed hyperplans? And this is one of the stated somewhere in chapter four, maybe, I don't remember. And to the best of my knowledge, there has not been any research in this direction. And I'm not sure how many people try to work on this. So it might not be impossible. And in case somebody's interested, I mean, it might something that one might try to give a, uh, give a go to. So now let's get back to two things that I said already. Well, one I said only implicitly, that C infinity is a C infinity. C0 is a C infinity smooth norm. And the second one is this uh, result by Hayek. No space of countable dimension have a C infinity smooth norm. And now I will uh, reveal to you the secret behind both proofs, which is the secret of smoothness. So what is the main trick to prove both of them together. The trick is, is a picture, and I will draw it here. And the picture will prove the first item first. This is the simplest C infinity smooth approximation result that is present in the literature. And then I will discuss how this simple trick allows to go to the other case. So I'll probably... One question. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you say normal spaces, you're assuming it's not complete? Um, in, in this case, it's not complete because it has a countable dimension, right? So oh, by the okay, back category okay, theorem, countable. it cannot be a Banach space. Dimension, yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, in general, if I say no, I mean not, not Banach, yeah. but it could apply also to Banach. But yeah, but in general, I mean, I will talk about not complete ones, so yes. So I will probably draw the picture, so I will probably move some colors. So now take a vector in, in, in C0. If the vector is in C0, we all know that we can more or less represent it as some, any supposed as norm one. So it has to be something like this, right? There are some coordinates that are one because it's a unit vector, but then it has to decrease to zero because it's a, convert, it's a sequence that goes to zero. So what does it mean? It means that there are finitely many coordinates that can be of order one, right? This is level one. Some coordinates can be big. But after finitely many coordinates, everything else has to be small. So there is a jump, and everything else is smaller. And this jump, I know, well, in, in the case of C0, it can be, the jump can be essentially one, it can be one minus epsilon. But in general, I'm only interested in the case where this jump is at least some delta. So this is a vector in C0, right? And now I build this function. Now, okay, this, take a picture. Now I build this type of functions. These really are on the real line. And they have this shape. So here is one. At the point one, the functions equal one. And this is the point one minus epsilon. And the function has to be, well, even. So they have to be equal to the other side. Okay. They have to be convex and C infinity. So here, well, if you believe me, this is smooth. So this has to be. Okay, so th th there are some functions you take convolutions and this kind of stuff. It's a function on the real line. And the main property is that it gives one to one and it's zero for slightly smaller things. And you can choose epsilon very small. Now we have this function, 
and we take now I'm gonna write a formula which might make no sense. Can you actually see this before? Okay. It might look nonsense, but I will explain to you what it really does. So you take this function uh, psi, where x is in C0 gamma, and this will be the sum of well, this function is called little phi. So it is phi of x gamma, where gamma is in the index set for some x in C0 gamma. So what am I doing? I take a vector in C0 gamma. I take its coordinates. I apply phi. So I take phi of the coordinates and I sum over all possible numbers. This object, whatever it is, is a sum of positive numbers. So it's well defined, right? There is no issue. It might be infinity, but it's well defined. And now it might be nonsense why this should do something useful, but it doesn't really what we want to do. And actually, the sum is finite. And the, the final set will be the set where this function is at most one. I claim that this is essentially the unit ball of C0. Okay. So although this function seems to be totally nonsense, it's very unclear what it does at the moment, I know. But if you take the level set where it is at most one, this level set approximates the unit ball. First of all, this function is convex because it's sum of convex functions, it's even and so on. So this is a convex symmetric set, okay? And now let me first draw this set in the plane, literally for two coordinates. So what does it do? So if the function is at most, if the sum of two is not at most one, they both are at most one. But phi of x is most one if x is an absolute value smaller than one. So it means if you are inside the ball, the, the, the square. So our set is contained in the unit ball of C, in the canonical unit ball. Now take something whose x coordinate is smaller than one minus epsilon. The first coordinate is smaller than one minus epsilon. Then phi of x is zero. So the first term does not show up and it's only the second. So in this area, The, the boundary is exactly the one of C0. Here is the same. And my symmetry here is the same. Now, this point here does not belong to the book, to the set, because here, what is the value of the function? It is while, while twice phi of one, which is bigger than phi of one, which is two actually. So the ball does not contain this point. Now, this function is C infinity, so this function at least in the plane is differentiable. It's a sum of differentiable functions. So by implicit functions, this is also locally represented by a graph of a smooth function. So I cannot draw any corners. So as it turns out, there is not many options that this has been this way, right? It has to be a convex set. <coughs> so this set really is this one. And now you probably see why it should approximate this the C0 norm. So in general, by, by, by more or less the picture, we can show that this set is contained in the unit ball. Why? Well, if you take something where the sum is at most one, all terms have to be at most one, they are positive numbers. But if the term is one, it means that the corresponding coordinate is at most one. So you are in the unit ball. And vice versa, if you take something of norm at most one minus epsilon, actually phi is zero. So one minus epsilon the ball is contained in this set. Why? Well, take something of norm at most one minus epsilon, and I claim that this is zero. Well, all coordinates are zero, because here everything is zero. If this x gamma is smaller than one minus epsilon, phi of gamma, x gamma is zero. So if you take something of norm at most one minus epsilon, all coordinates are zero. So you are in, actually you are in the set where phi is equal to zero. So this set approximates the unit ball. Now, if you take its Minkowski functional, it will be a norm which approximates the canonical norm. And why is it this differentiable? 
No, my question is, uh, <laughs> since uh, you have not uh, required any sign of the evaluation of the elements of C0, mm -hmm. um, this set is not symmetric. But no, phi, phi is even. Okay. You oh, can yeah. put the absolute oh, yeah, value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, usually, actually, most people usually put the absolute value. Oh, you have to. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is the first half. Yes. The function is even. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Yes. Now, why is it differentiable? Well, I said, now look at the picture. This function is a finite sum because there are finitely many coordinates bigger than one minus epsilon. If you take a point, there are plenty many coordinates bigger than epsilon. So for all the others, the value falls here. So phi doesn't see it. So this function really is a finite sum. For every point, it's a finite sum. And now that the real trick, the real trick comes, go back to the picture, why did I put it? Take this vector and perturb it. Can the, the picture change? No. no. I mean, if there was this big jump and I approximate by something little, here the max will be more or less here, and then it will, here what can happen? Well, I can increase by epsilon. So there still is the jump, which is delta minus two epsilon, but whatever. So if I move slightly my point, the picture remains the same. So there was a jump, there still is the jump. What does it mean? Well, it means that in a neighborhood, the function is a finite sum. I pick a point, in a neighborhood, there are only finitely many terms. Well, but the finite sum of differentiable functions is differentiable. So this is infinity. And now from the fact that this is infinity, well, I convinced you already before that the level set has to be locally something differentiable using the implicit function theorem. This really works in full generality. There is a lemma that says you more or less that if this function is differentiable, this set is a, is a, is a Minkowski, no. The Minkowski functional of this set is a differentiable norm. It's a lemma, which is essentially implicit function theorem. So this is the secret. And if you check most of paper is smoothness, at some point there will be these functions. There will be this trick of, this is what I call in the slide, strong maxima, right? This is a strong maximum. Finally, many coordinates are big, the others are substantially smaller in a quantitative way. Quantitative maximum, whatever name you want. So the, the, the trick is always the same. And then there are these weird sums of functions and you take the level sets and it works. So this is a trick. And this really proves the first item. Now, uh, now in order to prove the last one, I actually show a different result. I don't really prove it. I just claim that it's the same argument. Now, this might seem something, something weird, but you take, well, let me see here, you don't see anything. So you take this vector space, the linear span of characteristic functions in infinity. So it can also be said like the functions that they infinitely many values, which explains the letter f, or the linear span of the extreme points in an infinity, of the ball of infinity. And we prove that this object at the same thing is smooth norm. How did we do? Well, there was a secret there. We just follow the machinery. So we use another standard trick. In polyhedrality, this is typically uh, attributed to Vladimir Fong. But it's also present in smoothness in many, <laughs> many, and it's, I mean, it's nothing clever. You take a sequence that decreases to zero, and it's clever, but it's nothing deep. It is a clever trick, but a stupid one. So you take a sequence that decreases to zero, and you multiply your vector by this sequence. So you kind of scale the vector. Now, take this vector here. It did attain the maximum, right? It, it attains many, many values, so it attains the maximum. So what does this vector look like? Well, it has to be something of this form. There is its maximum, which is attained here, and then there are some other values that are smaller. Now, if I multiply, take a coordinate that attains the maximum, and take the next coordinate. When you multiply, this goes up by some constant, one plus epsilon some value. This goes up by something less. How much? Well, I know epsilon, well, let's say that this is position k, so there is a difference of one plus epsilon k plus one divided by one plus epsilon k. So there is a there is some jump here. Now what do I do? I look at the picture over there. There is a jump. 
So everything goes. I mean, that, there is a hope to do, but I mean, you just have to check that this is a proof and not just a picture. And now, what about this? Well, this result was proved by Hayek with a different technique, but it also follows from, from, this, uh, from this construction here. And the trick is that when well, L infinity contains separable Banach spaces, so also separable norm spaces. So we take X to be inside L infinity, is the linear span of a sequence. I approximate these EJs with something which is in L infinity F, because this is dense, a simple function of dense. So I can approximate. And now, if I do them in a very close way, the linear span of the IJs is, of the EJs is isomorphic to the linear span of the EJs. So X is isomorphic to this linear span, but this linear span is inside here. So it has a simple smooth norm. And why are they isomorphic? Well, this is small perturbation. So it just perturbs likely something you would remain isomorphic. Okay. So this is the conclusion of the argument. And in reality, uh, well, I, I wrote it for C infinity smoothness because it's simpler to prove it, but the same proof gives analyticity. Okay, it has to be done in a more clever, in a more uh, subtle way because you cannot use the functions from there, they are not analytic. But if you use some polynomials, it's just slightly more technical, but the, the argument is the same. So for C0, you cannot do analytic? For C0, you can do analytic in the set of all case. For C0, you can do analytic, but not for C0 gamma. So this is there an example where you can do C infinity but not analytic? Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes, because polynomials on C0 gamma are countably supported. So there is no analytic normal C0 gamma. Yes. These are results due to Perchinsky and uh, Boya Gornitz of some some perturbation of his name. And there is uh, any restriction on the distortion of uh, on the renormies? The distortion of the renormies. Yes, it can be made one at one percent because yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look there, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very close. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to talk about the density, but yes. Okay. Yeah. And there is one thing I was hiding. Well, the small perturbation of lemma is a theorem for basic sequences. And here, IJ is a sequence run, as a random sequence. Well, okay, I was cheating. If you take the IJs to be a, a, a Markushevich basis, which you can do, this works. Okay. So you have to select this in a kind of uh, canonical way. It has to be a, a Markushevich basis, and then the small perturbation lemma works for Markushevich basis, and then it works. But this is a technicality. I mean, the idea is you, you can really embed into this object where you have already everything and so on. So yes, here there is also analytic norm. And the point is that for analytic norms, analytic norms are series of polynomials. So there is some countability issue there. And so it works if you are in L infinity because there are countability coordinates. If you go beyond spaces like L infinity, the things go different. <laughs> and for example, I didn't write it, but since we are here, the same proof also gives that this space here as an analytic norm as long as gamma is carried at most continuum because you can embed it again in L infinity. But we don't know whether you can do it in for continuum plus. So if you take L1 of continuum plus, we don't know if there is a dense subspace with an analytic norm. We guess no, but we don't know. So this is another thing that is of some interest. Now I am half of my time and I think there's a good moment to stop for a second and check if there is some more questions. So are this uh, uh, C infinite and analytic the equivalent of separable spaces? Um, I think I'm not sure. I tend, I would claim no, but I'm not sure. But for example, it's also open. If you have a Banach space with that has a CK norm for every K, it's not known if it has a C infinity. So this is not known. While for the difference, C infinity and analytic, I guess there might be a difference, but I have to think about. Um, well, the reality is that I should know the answer, but I, I don't know. I, I do, at the moment, I don't have an example, but I, I, it should be known and they should be different, but I'm not sure. I should think at it for a second more. So the same paper we were, okay, this is for, Essentially separable, we start separable dual with sex, we start separable dual spaces embedding in an infinity. What about bigger spaces? We really wanted to obtain something for bigger spaces. And what we had was this result where you take an unconditional basis and again the linear span of the basis. 
And here we only obtain CMP in this smoothness, and I will comment on analytics in, in a second. Now, this was uh, a good indication of the fact that you can face non separable results as well, because it covers non separable spaces. But I mean, unconditional bases are quite a strong assumption. And in the non separable case, even more. So it was like, well, it's a nice result, but it's not extremely general. So we were satisfied, but not happy. And then it took a while. This paper appeared on the archive in January, like two days after, well, during the winter school in the uh, abstract analysis. But I should mention that half of this talk is copy pasted from that winter school. So I should apologize for people that were at the winter school. Some of the slides are just copied. The next one is not. It, there, are, but there is one slide to just copy pasted, not, but only one of the eight. I, I did my best. <laughs> and so it, that paper appeared on the archive during the winter school. And now the assumption is much more general because we only require the existence of a fundamental orthogonal system. Again, this is a, I would say it's a well-known notion in non-separable Banach spaces, but well-known as usual means well-known to those who know it. And yeah, that's my property. I have no clue what it is. So I will define it in, in two slides, but for the moment, let me just say that it is a notion. And you take again the linear span. And okay. It, it, it generalizes the concept of, of shadow basis. So it's a system of coordinates as well. So it is more general than unconditionality. So then we essentially have everything we might look for. There is a polyhedral norm, which locally depends on fenty many coordinates. And now LFC is going to be defined in a second. There is a C infinity smooth norm, which is also LFC. And there is a C1 smooth norm, which is also simultaneously locally from the rock. Moreover, here I also put comment on density such norms are dense. So you essentially have everything that you might want to have. And I will comment on this in the next slide. In reality, we have more that I didn't add here because it didn't fit the slide, but uh, we also have partitions of the unity. And if you have partitions of the unity, you also have approximation of continuous functions by smooth functions, approximation of liquid functions by smooth functions, and so on. So you essentially have all possible results concerning smoothness. Now, the end of the slide is dedicated to the definition of LFC. I'm not sure whether it really makes sense to read it. I mean, it's a technical condition, but it, it should be read as for every point in a neighborhood, the norm depends on friendly main ingredients, right? There are friendly main functionals, coordinates, such that the norm only depends on these numbers. And you should really look at that picture because I did prove that the norm of C0 locally depends on fundamental coordinates. Because in a neighborhood, only the numbers from here to here have a role, right? The norm does not depend on what happens here. It only sees the first coordinates. In a neighborhood, only fundamental coordinates determine the norm. In a neighborhood, fundamental coordinates determine the norm, right? There's a function such that the norm is function of fundamental coordinates. So LFC means the same picture again. So now in the next two slides, I should, well, one of, the, one of the two, I should discuss this here and how, and I should elaborate on two directions, how strong and how general. So how, how close is this to being a complete result? And how general is, to how many spaces does it apply? In the first direction, I said that this is optimal. You cannot do any better. So now let's look, what, what could you hope for in a better direction? Well, you could want analytic norms here, you could obtain, you could want C2 smooth anywhere here. Yeah? And I claim that none of them are possible. The first reason is that there was this result by Perczynski and Boygarvich that I mentioned before that C1, C, C0 of omega 1 has no analytic norm. And in reality, we observed in the previous paper that essentially their argument shows that the same is true on dense subspaces. So no dense subspace of C0 omega 1 has an analytic norm. So we cannot go beyond the same thing. This is too much non separable for having analytic norms. So infinity is optimal. And now C2. Well, here's again is an old result. If you have a norm, I mean it's older than me, it's an old result. If you have a norm space with a let's say C2 smooth norm, which is locally uniformly rotten, then the completion is super reflexive. So if you have C2 plus LUR, you cannot be a C0 gamma. The completion has to be super reflexive. So again, here you cannot obtain C. There is nothing more you can do. <coughs> and 
And now, where could we improve? Well, here I took only this subspace, right? This subspace has, a, has everything that we might want to have. But what about other subspaces? And this is the main problem in the area. What happens if you take a different subspace? The problem, one of the problems is that, in a sense that can be made precise, if you take different subspaces, they can be extremely different. And I don't want to say what it means, because it took us one paper to understand and define and prove that they can be different. So there is this reference here. But I won't go into any more detail. But I will just comment that in my last slide, I will say a bit more about finding the differentiability in, in different subspaces in very few instances. And now let me return to the main problem. This is the thing that we really want to solve since working on this project. It has been a couple of years that we fail. The question is whether there is a Banach space such that no dense subspace of X has a CK smooth norm. We know the answer is negative for analytic norms, but we don't know for C infinity. We don't know for C1. And this is the main problem that they consider to be uh, in, in, I mean, in the negative direction for the, in the area. So now I was commenting about Banach lattices. This is open also for Banach lattices. And if you trust this plebanic finality lemma that was claimed already uh, during the talk already, if there is a counterexample, there is a C of K counterexample, right? This is this plebanic finality argument. And if there is a CK counterexample, in particular, there is a Banach lattice counterexample. So I don't know. And maybe. I don't know. This I just throw it in for free Banach lattices. Maybe there is no counterexample. I don't know. I mean, if you manage to see in a free Banach lattice some dense subspace where you have this maximum in a strong way, well, then we should talk together because then it's more or less union of known stuff. It should give it a result. So, in case somebody interested in Banach lattices wants to give a look at the problem, I mean, there is a study, but Neither of the authors of none of us knows a lot about Banach lattices. So it might be easy for people who know the answer, who know the techniques. Now let's go to um, how general the result is. This is the slide that is copied from the Winter School. The audience was a bit different, so enter at your own risk. So if you understand zero about the slide, well, it's not such a big deal. The, the real thing written in the slide is the result is very general. How general it really means? Well, here is the definition of fundamental orthogonal system. So a orthogonal system is just a pair of vectors of x and functionals on x star of of x star, such that the functional is uh, orthogonal, so the, the evaluation is the conical delta, and the linear span is dense. The linear span of the vectors is dense, and this is the notion of fundamental. A orthogonal system has this first property: fundamentals means the second one. Now, where do they exist? Uh, Lichko spaces, which includes for, for us, let's say, reflexive WCG. This was mentioned already, so I feel like I can mention them. C0 gamma, L1 mu for a finite measure, C of K for many compact spaces like for Bolivia or Abelian compact groups. Uh, Calenda a couple of years ago in this uh, proceedings of LMS uh, paper that if you have a projectional skeleton, then you have a fundamental orthogonal system. And here there's a list of spaces that have this condition. So the other one spaces, radius of phenomenal algebra, radius of JBW star tripods. And well, here I'm not assuming that anybody knows this notion. I mean, I'm not assuming this from anybody, including myself. <laughs> uh, there was a, a plenary speaker at the, uh, at the winter school giving lectures on this subject, but I can't guarantee I remember the definition from them. So there it made more sense than now. So let's jump over. Continuous functions on trees, and infinity gamma for every set gamma, and also this this set this Banach space that was mentioned by Nils, by Nils, sorry, uh, that was studied by Tomek, uh, Gideon, and uh, and Bill Johnson, and infinity C of of lambda, but only when lambda is as density is cardinalized at most continuum. So these are all examples of spaces with a fundamental orthogonal system. Then also. Spaces with a WCG quotient of the same density. So if you can quotient on a WCG, you can lift the, C, the fundamental system. And finally, you might say, well, okay, but who doesn't? And there is a celebrated result by Todorcevic that under Martin Maximum, all Banach spaces of density omega one 
have a fundamental orthogonal system. So it is consistent that all space of density omega one fall in our result. Yet there are Banach spaces with a fundamental orthogonal system. One example is here. This object here where they said it's big. Or several C of K spaces like the C of K over the Kunen compact space. There are several C of K spaces that are built under axioms and do not contain any uncountable orthogonal systems. So we cover many spaces, but we don't cover all of them. And now uh, this has not been announced in the abstract for a simple reason that we didn't have the result at the times. And it's not on the archive yet. It will be, uh, it's in preparation in the sense that Jesus used, used yesterday. So it's, there is a process that might terminate at some point or not. So the point is that if you take, well, what is the result? You take LP, LP gamma, and you take as a dense subspace, and R of gamma for some R smaller than P. And here I mean really subspace in the linear sense. Okay? So it's a linear subspace. You take the vectors in LP that are R integrable. So for example, you take L1 inside L2. And I claim that there is a simply smooth norm as well. Now, um, in the case of, let, let's, let's think of the separable case, just to have an idea of what is happening, because maybe it's the inter most interesting case. If you take LP, this subspace has <coughs> linear dimension, the continuum, while before in the separable case, there everything had dimension, uh, there was a countable dimension, right? So in the separable case, we go from dimension omega to dimension continuum. And did I write it here? Ah, why is the writer that in this order? Well, we have it for LP. We don't know if this is true for every separable Banach space. We didn't really think any spoken for too much, to be honest. So the question is, if you have a separable Banach space, does it admit a dense subspace of dimension continuum that has a smooth norm, okay? If I remove this requirement that the linear dimension is continuum, the answer is positive, it is result by Hayek. But we don't know whether you can build a subspace which is also big, big in, in the linear sense. And now let me go a bit better, a bit, bit back, not better, also better if possible. And to connect with the talk that Mark Menes was uh, talking about yesterday, this is a linear image of Banach space, of course, it's linear image of al So this subspace is also an operator range. And we learned yesterday that operator ranges are kind of, in some sense, more complete in the general norm space. So building smoothness in operator ranges is a bit harder. But here there is P bigger than one, because of course they need R to possibly be, be at least one, because they want a Banach space. And on the other hand, if you take non-separable operator ranges in L1 gamma, well, then they have to contain L1 of omega one. And this is really an operator, operator algebra result because it means that the, the operator fixes a copy of L1 of omega one. This, uh, this, uh, this is this classical paper by Rosenthal about this, this jointization of measures and applications. And it put there, so you cannot obtain the same result for P equals to one. So here's the question that I was stating before already. And I would like to add a couple of more questions. This, I, both of them I asked already at this conference in Castellon a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm not sure anybody in, in the world ever thought of them, including the authors of papers. So they might be easy to in the sense that I don't know. I mean, they're not exercises and probably not straightforward. But they might be viable. The first one is if you have a dense hyperplane in L1, can it have a smooth norm? The answer really should be no, because it's a hyperplane. I mean, how can you have smoothness in something which is linearly everything but one direction? It really fits too, too extreme. But who knows? Maybe there is a way to build such norm, or maybe you are able to prove that there is no such norm, but we don't know how to prove it. And then the other one is. Uh, taking a very explicit example, simple functions in L1, what happens there? Can you build smooth, smooth norms in this subspace? So this could be, I mean, they're I mean, they not famous problems. They were formulated by, I think it was me giving the talk in that occasion. So they're not super famous problems. So they might be uh, of essentially easy solution. Now, at this point, I guess everybody's really interested in the references for reading my papers. So here are the references. <laughs> 
And so the first one is this published paper where we uh, discuss the problem and we pose the question. This one is the, the one on the archive from January where there is this most general result on fundamental orthogonal systems. Here is the paper where we discuss this uh, difference between distinct uh, dense subspaces. And here is the one in preparation that will at some point show up. I guess everybody was very much interested in the references, but I guess everybody was also very interested in coffee break. So I, I will finish here. Thanks a lot.